the outset let me thank each one of you for uh, bearing the storm of traffic congestion and being here this evening and uh, i welcome each one of you for the first ajay gandhi memorial lecture i know that in spite of the traffic what brings you here is the love and affection each one of us have for ajay ajay was a firm believer in free speech and in his belief of free speech there were no compromises no restrictions i did not entirely subscribe to it i thought free speech should have reasonable restrictions he firmly believed in free enterprise and the spirit of man to solve society's problems i always thought that it was necessary for the state to participate to solve some of society's problems before he passed away he was really worried about the decline in democratic values and the compromises we make with our institutions i was never so worried because i think people will find their solutions in the spirit of the constitution his economics were never left of center minor his organizational abilities was the best i have seen in my lifetime working in many organizations especially the care he would take for every individual and for every month and night to make sure that they were comfortable i always doubt whether i could ever match his empathy for the audience it always surprised me that how much we differed in our various views and how easily we worked together for 16 years actually i worked with him for 40 years i would hazard to say it was only because we were democratic and we respected diversity it is all made possible only because of ajay of what he was free thinker democratic inclusive affectionate and full of empathy we had a great partnership and no less contributed by his family neeta mansi nihar part some of you may not know but part and my son somitri were the early what we call them as mic runners mansi and nihar are entirely responsible for our media presence and for the successes of sambad we are going to have one more on october 2nd his brother kamlesh keeps our facebook debates going neeta pushed ajay and me many times as a pillar of strength whenever we were in doubt it is i must recognize here that it is all this is also possible because of ajay's fantastic equation with our advisory board mr madhavrao sunita our two rams sujata ranjan chandana challa shravan tamlesh throughout the years we are all together thanks to the openness warmth of friendship and honesty of ajay and on top of it his expert communication skills he left us rather suddenly and but the path he laid for us in manthan and for all of us who have built the institution for all of us here in the last 16 years i think the path is very clear open doors open minds sort of captures the spirit of manthan and ajay completely it is in that spirit we have our old friend mr p t rajan today the honorable minister of finance tamil nadu who readily agreed to speak to us for the first ajay memorial lecture he is first i must say he is no stranger to manthan if you remember sir you spoke to us on february 7th 2015 on the collapse of lehman brothers it was a brilliant talk on the insights of the collapse of the brothers clinically analyzed i will i am still not sure whether you were elected to the assembly at that time no our general conclusion after the speech was between me and ajay that 
This is why we are doing Manthan. We have an expert talking to us expertly and analyzing clinically the problem. And we go back out of the Manthan wiser and uh, we, are, we are ready to see a fresh perspective. Mr. P.T. Rajan is one of the first few who kept us going all these years. He needs no introduction, so I'll stick to that, saying that he needs no introduction. So I won't read when you were born, when you were, what you did. We can find that out from the net. We, I knew of the traffic situation today, and uh, but we still decided to go ahead because uh, Ajay liked this venue most, or I also like this venue. And this is where our children grew up and where in the past years of our work we painstakingly built this institution through many engaging discussions, each one better than the other. I must also thank here Suhim who, suggest, who suggested this idea of a memorial lecture and keeping the spirit of Ajay burning bright. Once again I welcome Mr. Rajan. Uh, to what promises to be a very interesting lecture and a Q&A session thereafter. Thank you. Let me first thank Vikram and the Advisory Board of Manthan for continuing the important work that was started many years ago with Ajay as a major inspiration and driver for instituting this lecture in his memory and for inviting me to deliver this inaugural address. I know it's been a bit of a rough day for travel and logistics. I'm very grateful you all came out. And in the spirit of uh, more of a debate or a dialogue, I'll try and restrict my remarks and uh, leave a lot of time for Q&A. I only ever met Ajay once when I came in 2015, as Vikram just mentioned. But through my own personal experience uh, at the passing of my father, who I had lived away from for decades before he passed, the lesson I take and I took is that the mark of a person is only really felt after their passing in the institutions they built, in the voids they leave, in people, in the impact their work has for generations and years to come. In that sense, I think, you know, all of you here today represent the major impact that Ajay had at a time when there wasn't the kind of premium on free speech that there is today. He had the vision to start this as a exchange of ideas and continue it uh, as things became more and more constrained. I remember my earlier talk and I just want to say that when I came I was I had left banking and I had not yet joined public office. So at some level it was a leap of faith to call me you know, seven, eight years after the collapse, after many books had been written, after many lectures had been given, and asked me to speak. But I think uh, that was the value that Ajay placed on the judgment of those he trusted. And so I think almost sight unseen, maybe on some exchanges over WhatsApp or email, I was asked to come and speak. And I'll never forget, it was a warm evening, there were some dogs lazing around asleep here. Uh, the crowd was much less than today. And at the end of the talk, Ajay came almost bouncing from his seat and you could see the sparkle in his eye. And he was so excited because I think there had been some perspective, some ideas, some data, some, you know, um, insight that was uh, maybe he knew a bit more than he'd expected. <coughs> and I still remember him literally, you know, bouncing here. And I think I spoke for 30 or 35 minutes and then we had like another 45 minutes or something Q&A. 
and there was the enthusiasm that he uh, brought to the sharing of ideas and uh, the value of debate in a society in a democracy so in that sense i consider myself very privileged to uh, have this opportunity and i thank you once again to deliver this address the topic that's been given to me is perhaps a bit um I won't say beaten to death, but a bit uh, well discussed, starting uh, with this morning or this afternoon in um, a different event. But I'll try and uh, maybe take it to a level that is normally, uh, you know, we normally stop with the notion of federalism between uh, union and state governments. We don't really go down to the local bodies, and also in some ways the complexity of going to local bodies is much higher than the complexity of union state relations so i'll just maybe highlight a few things um and then we can go for a bit of a dialogue let me start first i'll, I'll try and kind of come through two strands and bring it all together let me start first with the notion of democracy right in a economic model that is not public ownership that is not communism shall i say the risk of any model of governance other than a monarchy or a dictatorship is if you keep everybody vested in the system then the system can have equilibrium and exist but the nature of economics the nature of competition the nature of you know, game theory is that it's very hard for you to keep equilibrium the rich get richer the poor get poorer this is the nature of all economic activity at all times it gets exacerbated when you have things like crises or huge uh, shifts in things like globalization access to capital transfer cost of travel etc in fact karl marx went so far in his manifesto as to say that effectively what would happen in a non communist non public ownership society would be that the returns to capital would keep on increasing and the returns to labor would keep on decreasing and at some point the labor would just revolt and say what's in it for me and you'd have you know a revolution and then everybody would go back to public ownership the antidote to that was supposed to be democracy it was supposed to be that if you went to one person one vote in respect of how wealthy or how poor then the people would vote only for those who would keep equilibrium who would keep inclusion who would keep everybody along with them and therefore the worst excesses of uh, you know a marxian prediction would not come true but in fact um you know there are many models of democracy itself right there are those purists who would argue that any complex issue should be taken to referendum every time there are those who would say we should have only one or two levels of government there are people like me who say we should have government closest to the people so it's not clear um which is the best model of democracy there's also the question of uh, efficiency versus participation you know is there one policy that therefore makes it easy everybody is g- going down the same path um or do you have different uh, within the same umbrella different approaches different policies is that a better outcome even though it's more complex and difficult to implement then there's the question of uh, stability versus accountability you know should we have uh elections every 2 or 3 years like they do in let's say australia or should we have you know 5 years or 6 years continuity stability allows me to learn the job execute bring results but if i'm no good at it if you let me sit for 6 years i may cause real damage to the system there's a lot of um question also of timing you know when the country is nascent and the notion of democracy is new then maybe you need some kind of a cohesive union uh, government that basically uh, brings everybody together in a land that is culturally diverse and that's got thousands of years of history you create a country just because we say so 
and you still have many residual kingdoms and all that stuff that you have to integrate later. So, you know, what's the um, kind of right trade-off in how you design the model and how much power or authority or capability, responsibility you place at which level of democracy? And all of these things basically vary across time, right? Uh, if you look around the world, as scale increases, as complexity increases, as education levels increase, as economic uh, standards increase, people want more and more access to self-determination. And uh, you find that devolution of power is the norm in, in any developing country, in any advancing economy. So if we take that as the notion of democracy, let me start from a separate thread which is the Dravidian movement that many generations of my forefathers helped to create and then perpetuate till now. And at the core of the Dravidian movement was this notion that all people are born equal and that there should be the notion of self-respect, that there is no hierarchy that says who is higher, who is lower, who is middle, who can go where, who can touch what, who should walk where. And so it says you don't need a validation system outside of you it starts with self-respect. And you go from self-respect to say, okay, then everybody should have the right to achieve their full potential and things that we now call inclusive growth or social mobility and all that baked into this concept that if anybody can be anybody, then really education is the basis. You have to start with giving education because in the past, education was restricted to certain people and not everybody was given access. So you start with self-respect equal access to education. And uh, at least in the case of the Dravidian movement, the first priority was equal rights to women. So in 1921, when the Justice Party government was formed, voting rights for women, legislators that's women, compulsory elementary education for boys and girls in 1921. So you start from that notion that all are born equal, all should have equal access, all should start with education as the conversion factor that goes from millennia or centuries of a, of a hierarchy into a more neutral um, structure of society or more balanced or equal. Then it doesn't take long for you to go that everybody should have access, everybody should have rights, the system should be reverse engineered to make up for millennia of discrimination by having quotas, reservations, percentage of the population equals percentage of the seats, etc. Thinking for oneself, what is called rationalism, and eventually it takes you to the only logical conclusion says, I should have a role or a say in my future, the right to self-determination. And the likelihood of having self-determination is much more, uh, what can I say, reachable or uh, envisionable should that governance level be closer to me? So if I take in my constituency in Madurai, the average councillor in the Madurai Corporation has about 10,000 voters and li likely lives within that 10 or 15th street area that those voters live in. I'm an MLA, I have about 250,000 voters. My MP cover six MLA constituencies has about one and a half million voters. The odds that the voters can even reach the MP is pretty close to zero. So the likelihood of the voice being heard, the likelihood of you being able to hold somebody accountable is much higher if it is a better ratio and closer to you. So in this context, it was very clear from the early days of Dravidianism that local self-governance, in particular uh, states' rights and devolution of powers to district boards, to uh, taluk level and to the village panchayats was a key factor. In fact, the other day I was going to Palani for a uh, the temple function and I saw a defunct bridge on the side where somebody told me, go look at the, the um, stone you know, inlay inscription and it was some 1920 uh, something my grandfather had opened a bridge and the district board president 
had been the one that had funded the bridge and my grandfather had come as a minister and opened the bridge. Right? So I'm saying 1920s, there was a district board that had the money to lay bridges. That was the devolution. So I put both these trends together and say, if uh, giving people participation in democracy, if, you know, at the, at the core of federalism is the notion that I should have some say in how my government, my society, my uh, government's policies and schemes are run. And in particular, that if it is going to be a complex or a big thing, that I should have a seat at the table. I'm not saying it will go my way, but I should have the capacity to be in the debate. And that's really at the heart of federalism as I see it and as we talked about it earlier today. Now, if you look around the world, uh, this is a commonly cited uh, context, so I won't bore you with the details, but I lived 20 years in the U.S. In the U.S., uh, the, s the local village or town or city runs the school board. It runs the police. It sets the alcohol policy. It sets some portion of the local taxation. In fact, in cities of New York and L.A., you have income taxes. Then you go from there to the county, and uh, in, in my county where I lived in Erie County, they set the hours of opening, the sales tax, uh, you know, certain broad templates within which the cities and the villages can work. And then we go to the state, and the states actually started out as independent governments that chose to come together in the United States of America. So from the beginning, 100% of the rights were with them, and they gave up some of it to the union government uh, of the United States. So. In a uh, place like that, the great advantage is the school board sets the syllabus for that set of schools. The parents of that town or that village get to be on the school board. Therefore, they get to determine what their children study, not somebody in the state of New York, certainly not somebody in Washington, D.C. So you take that as the capitalist model of extremes. Then you go the other way and you go to China. In China, the city of Shanghai runs its own pollution control board, runs its own police, runs its own schools, runs its own environmental clearance, industrial permits, everything. And the provinces issue banking licenses. I used to work for a large global bank called Standard Chartered Bank. Standard Chartered Bank couldn't get, there's no such thing as a pan-China license. You have to get a province-by-province -province banking license and the ability to open branches in that province. These extremes of communism and capitalism have significantly devolved powers because they are large, complex organizations and it's not imaginable that sitting in one place you can run these things. Forget if the policy is even similar. The execution ability sitting in one place is close to zero. So you devolve or you start with my rights of which I'll give up some to you. You take other countries, you take uh, Germany or Australia, or for that matter, you take a Switzerland, tiny country, shouldn't have that much complexity. But in Switzerland, if you want to go through an immigration process to get permanent residency, that canton has to decide whether you're fit to become a PR or a citizen of, uh, of Switzerland, right? Because they say you're going to live there, that society should have a say in whether you're an apt citizen. Now, of course, there can be you know, some excesses. For example, if you're in a place where they teach creationism, then clearly that's an unacceptable way of educating children. Right? Uh, if you're in a place that uh, endorses bigotry, clearly, or, or racism, clearly you cannot run a police force that is uh, openly racist, at least. So you have to have some checks and balances. And really, in India today, these are the two levels at which we should think about it. When it comes union to state, I think the issues are not that complicated. They're not that complicated because pretty much everybody had one go till about eight or, you know, eight and change years ago, including the current prime minister of the country who, when he was chief minister, was the greatest, most articulate, most vociferous advocate for states' rights. Now all of a sudden we find the world is somehow you know, turned upside down. But where the real complexity comes in is between the state and local governments. And 
I'll give you a few perspectives from Tamil Nadu. Um, but before I do that, I'll say, why there should only be a secular movement towards more devolution or decentralization is very clear. As size increases, complexity increases. And as complexity increases, diversity increases. As diversity increases, the need for customization increases. The likelihood of customization being successfully done is much closer to the people than very far away from the people, first of all, because there's no one place where you can come up with 31 different state policies. That's what the state governments are for. If you look at our country today, uh, the level, the state level variability is huge. You know, between the best and the worst state on any measure, if you started in, at independence, the ratio is probably no better than two is to one for the best state. By the 1980s, that had probably expanded to three or four is to one. Then came reform. Every time you have something like reform, which is another version of what I just said about globalization, those that are poised, those that have built the infrastructure for it, in the case of Tamil Nadu, it was a highly educated English-speaking workforce with decent physical infrastructure. Those will benefit hugely disproportionately. And then the gap started really expanding. And so if you look over the last 20, 30 years, uh, the worst to the best state in some measures, maybe 10 is to 1, 20 is to 1. Uh, you take some states like Tamil Nadu, about a third of our budget comes from our share of the taxes sent from us to the union that comes back, some fraction of it. You take some states, you take Bihar, 80% of the annual budget of Bihar comes from the union government. You take Northeast, probably 95% of the budget comes from the union government. So you have seen such a huge variability in development across states, not just in economic terms, but in social indicators, human indicators, education levels, access to medicine, number of doctors per thousand people, pick any measure. But if you look within a state, the change has not been that great. Even in Tamil Nadu, where I'd say there is a rural urban divide, it's not nearly as big a divide as a uh, state-to-state state divide. Partly because, in fact, devolution to the local bodies never started till very late and till now is very uh, minimal. So even though the constitution calls for many things that one could equate to self-determination or devolution down to the lowest level, and Gandhi one time had this dream of five lakh uh, village panchayat pre uh, governments or something to that effect. But really it was only in the 73rd and 74th amendments in the in 92, I think, that even the concept of local bodies and Schedule 12, which created their responsibilities, came about. And it's been applied relatively unevenly uh, ever since. But in some cases, some people argue that maybe lack of devolution to local bodies has been a reasonable thing or maybe a good thing. Uh, a friend of mine who is the vice chairman of the Tamil Nadu uh, Planning Commission, State Planning Commission, has written a book where he says the uh, significant improvement in cost relations and the significant improvement in the universality of service provision in rural areas came when the government of Tamil Nadu decided to do away with this concept of a uh, Matame or, you know, uh, village uh, panchayat, uh, you know, elected by itself, not in through the democratic model, but through the caste system and all that, and centralized the delivery of services through um, line departments of the state of Tamil Nadu. So the meal scheme or the education scheme, they are not run they are, you know, uh, in theory, they have a local reporting line. In practice, the government of Tamil Nadu set the standard for all schools run the government of Tamil Nadu, not panchayat by panchayat, and that actually improved a lot of the uh, poor panchayats in his, perspe in his perspective. Um, 
access to uh, let's say seats in local bodies is reserved based on the constitutional uh, design and so many seats are meant for Adi Dravidar, so many seats are meant for women etc. In theory it works, in practice if you look around particularly in Tamil Nadu but in many cases you find the system gets subverted many 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 ways. Uh, you take Madhya Corporation where we recently held the elections. 50% of the seats are for women. Who are the women candidates? In many, many, many cases, they are the spouses of the men who would otherwise have been the candidates. And they are not actually the qualified women based on their own standing. It's still better than nothing because, you know, by the time they are five years sitting in the seat, at least some of the women will start to feel the power of their constitutional position. The constitutional position because the only they can attend the council meeting. The husband cannot. Only they can call the staff and ask questions the husband cannot or at least should not be able to. Then you find other outcomes where there are either no elections held or so-called unanimous elections. Uh, my chief minister recently after we came to office went and had a Grama Sabha meeting in a village where for 10 years after the act was passed and elections were not held because it was designated a reserved constituency and the caste uh, people would not allow the ballots to stand and then it became a mess and well, there were some murders and all that. And then he himself, when he was minister in 2006, he personally went, stayed in those villages, ran the elections, got the result and came out. So this was the commemoration of that. He went 15 years later to that. That's you know, some of the downsides of devolution. Of course, as education levels go up, as access to kind of global information goes up, for example, many people um, criticize the free uh, color television set, the 2000 rupee color television set that the DMK government of 2006-11 uh, instituted. Uh, Talavar Kalavar did it for a different reason. He said, in too many places, we see poor people standing outside rich people's houses and trying to look through their windows at the TV screen. And basically, um, this creates, again, this feudal hierarchy. And so we should get a TV to everybody's house. That was his intent. But now, if you look at the studies, there is a clear uh, evidence that the level of domestic violence dropped dramatically after village women started seeing what the notion of life was in the cities and in other parts of the world and that this was not the only way and they didn't have to take this. So, you know, th there's all these ways that society progresses that we don't sometimes envision. But eventually we'll get to a place where clearly we should do a lot more devolution. I'll just close with two examples that I would say give me hope of uh, how we can actually do much better with devolution and then maybe give you a bit of a sobering thought uh, based on a study my additional secretary of finance sent to me. The two positive examples, um, when we came to office we had the second wave of COVID and uh, it hit us probably within 10 days of taking office at the peak. In Madhra district, we were seeing maybe 1,500 cases or 1,300 cases a day. We got the best minds together, we talked about how to deal with this, we did a lot of analysis. We discovered that the biggest you know, source of infection was that everybody was coming to the district general hospital. And every patient was bringing three attendants, five attendants, and just spreading between those people. So we basically decided we have to find a way to uh, distribute this and keep the um, infected people closer to their homes and not come here. So we went through many things. We, we made probably uh, 10 different improvements. But the improvement that made the real difference or the biggest difference was we decided to set up 10 bed hospitals with oxygen tanks because the second wave was not that virulent. It just needed the right oxygen like two weeks into the infection or something. Uh, in every panchayat and we got 4,000 women under the women's self-help groups and we got them to go door to door and find people who were showing symptoms and take them to the local panchayat hospital rather than bring them to the GH. We instituted some strict limit on how many people could come to the GH. We gave free lunch to everybody who came 
so they didn't have to go and start looking for food and infecting other people in the area and all that. Uh, maybe half a dozen things. It wasn't, or maybe ten things. But because we took this distributed strategy, the daily rate went down from 1,500 to 150 in probably three weeks. Nowhere else in Tamil Nadu, within the same state, with the same infrastructure, with the same uh, kind of um, you know doctor-patient ratio and everything, nowhere else did it go down that much. So clearly, the ability to customize, the ability to localize, I mean, that's a classic example where I think we can show the upside of doing this in a, in a, in a developed way. The second example I'll give is, um, we have just, day before yesterday, my chief minister started a free breakfast program for uh, school children, a pilot basis. Um, and this was based on some data and that's what they say. Actually, the irony is we thought we were doing it for the poorest and the government schools and all that. But even in the last two days, we're hearing from a lot of middle class people saying that working women find it very hard to give cooked food to their children before they go to school at 7 or 7.30. So really, this ought to be a more broad societal uh, kind of scheme. But anyway, in these schools, um, when we were deciding how to do this, we already have a new meal scheme that was probably a pioneer in the country and very well fated and all that. But in that scheme, uh, if we spend 100 rupees on the scheme, actually we spend a few thousand crores, 70% of the spending goes for the pay of the people who make the food. And only 30% goes to the actual food and the energy and the utensils and the infrastructure and all that. So we decided we would innovate. And then also, a lot of trouble, I'm sure you've read in the papers, when you try to do supply tenders for, you know, thousands of tons. The odds of rent-seeking or rigging go up a lot. So this time, uh, with the Chief Minister's uh, guidance, we split it into two. It said, in the urban areas, we'll do uh, automation. As little human touch as possible. There's so many startups in Tamil Nadu itself that do automated cooking only for certain types. So we customize the meals to use automated cooking. I mean, within the nutrition levels and the fiber and all that stuff and the protein. And uh, make it as um, hygienic, as standardized, as predictable, as um, you know, touchless as possible, and let the corporations do it. So we give the money to the local corporation, and the corporation runs these kitchens and runs delivery trucks, standardized kitchens, and runs delivery trucks to all the schools. In the villages, we took a completely different approach. We said, let's give the money as a grant to a uh, group of women, self-help group of women who are formed from the mothers of the children and just give them the money. It's their job to procure the, I mean, we give them the money and give them a place to make the food. But then it's their job to procure the ingredients, to cook the food and to deliver it. And the odds that a mother will do it better for the children than the state is quite high, in our opinion. So we distribute it and we get it. And we haven't yet seen the results, we only got two days, but we're very optimistic that this will work. And this is a another example of how, you know, in terms of sustainable quality and accountability, this will be a better outcome. Uh, the eminent economist and founder of the NIPFP in Delhi, Raja Chalaya, once quote that everybody wants devolution to their level of government. Right? So in the states we say we want it from the union to us, but we don't really do it from us to the villages or the panchayats. In fact, the history of state finance commissions and uh, whether those reports are even taken up, whether the finance commission is constituted, whether the reports are taken up, whether actions are generated from that and whether they are put into implementation, um, the results are not good. This is a study that was done a few years ago. Uh, less than half the states had actually run a finance commission every five years, as had been required after the 92 uh, amendments. In Tamil Nadu, we just um, got the report of the sixth finance commission 
after we came to office as the finance minister i'm the sponsor of the commission um i gave them an extra 6 months or 9 months because of covid and all that but i also gave them some additional directive I said whatever tamil nadu asked of the union finance commission we apply that devolving power from us down and so we got a brilliant report uh, a few months ago we are going to table the action i mean table the action taken report in the house so since it's not yet tabled it's a bit private but i can say that uh, the recommendations include a lot of innovations uh in terms of you know giving the grants to we give grants by village or by taluk or by district but then we give it to the rural development ministry and they are supposed to administer the grants and the history is that once they get the money you know sometimes it goes and sometimes it doesn't go so you know there's a lot of innovations we can do um i for one as a former investment bank i always believe in aligning incentives if we don't back our um preferred outcomes with the right money then you know it's like shouting into the wind it means nothing so i think in the next few months uh, you'll see when we table the report and when we go through implementation that we are going to use the power of grants uh, much more effectively and make it much more direct and bring technology to play so we can actually uh, track that money is spent the way it's supposed to be spent for the people it's supposed to be spent etc at the time it's supposed to be spent in fact uh, government funds in many ways but one of the worst ways is that uh, the gap between intent and outcome is only partially because of subversion or partly i mean or rent seeking or um you know malfeasance many of the times is just a lack of competence or a lack of incentive alignment or a lack of focus uh, a lack of desire to get it done and in that sense i think um you know uh we can improve a lot of things if we just focused on those variables our philosophies may vary different parties may come from different perspectives it's only after we get the results that we get to say which is a better philosophy than not of course some things are really bad you know bigotry is bad hatred is bad othering is bad but otherwise should i go slightly left or slightly right or slightly more devolved or slightly less i think people who deliver results get to speak with a much louder voice than you know, uh, the rest of us so let me just uh, stop there i think and uh, open it up if that's okay yeah. uh, pt rajan for really a fascinating uh, lecture on this very important occasion uh, for manthan uh, fascinating lecture on a very important uh, topic um uh, at a time when the uh, flavor of the era is centralization extreme centralization of one india one everything uh, to talk about decentralization talk about devolution is very important and as you said um if at all there is any discussion it's about the center and the states there is very little about you know states to the uh, local bodies and you've given a number of examples as well as across the world about you know where and how it works Uh, thank you again thank you very much uh, we now open the uh, floor for um, uh, questions uh, please ask your questions and i pray that his soul rest in peace uh, now coming to the topic i uh, since finance minister of chennai is here i have our desire, i was part of his last session where he attended in itc but i could not get the opportunity to have a direct question to him since i got the opportunity through manthan i want to uh, ask a couple of questions to finance minister uh, finance minister since you told that you know uh important thing about accountability and education which will progress the great nation of india so uh, come uh, seeing around the uh, inconsistency and the uh, central government's you know dictatorship be it in terms of education and denying education to the uh, minority uh, children is exactly let's say an example of a hijab which is going on in debate in the supreme court and you told that education is something which will progress and uh, the issue was being first highlighted politically now the supreme court is discussing the issue 
number one. Number two, uh, the social unrest, uh, be it if you take geographically or economically and socially, uh, we are very much as an Indians are ignoring this fact that what is the unrest happening. If you say, uh, if you see geographically the unrest, the China is taking over, you know, the play, uh, uh, India in terms of you know occupation in uh, uh, northern eastern states and, and uh, where China is occupying. And if you see economic interest, uh, if everybody is experiencing what is the you know economic interest we are facing in terms of unemployment, poverty, and be it you know GST or you know anything if you say. So uh, you as a finance minister, how we can stop this? Because it's been more than two decades now, but still uh, BJP is progressing and RS is progressing, and it is not good for the democracy that so much unrest is there, but we st still as an Indians are ignoring this. Thank you. Assembly member, I am a state minister, I look at what's in my domain. I would just say generally two, three things should be true and eventually are always true in a democracy. One is that the more harmonious, the more inclusive, the more compassionate the society, the more likely you have long-term good outcomes in jobs, in growth, in quality of life, in quality of infrastructure. I think that's beyond debate. The second is that if you have this continuing gap or yearning gap between the aggregation of power on the one hand and the worsening outcome on the other hand, it's not good for a society. Normally, markets don't correct gently. They correct uh, violently or with volatility. I would say that uh, at the end of the day, People get the government they deserve. People elect their government and they get the government they deserve. So, you know, just like uh, my finance professors used to teach me that uh, you shouldn't think you're smarter than the market. I don't think I'm smarter than the voters on average. They'll vote their way and get their outcome. You know, I, I can't uh, second guess them. I just point to the fact that this devolved model produced phenomenally good results in the first wave of COVID. If you remember, Kerala was much, much better than all of us, certainly much better than Tamil Nadu. Somehow, by the time the second wave came around, uh, Kerala had uh, as bad or worse outcomes. So I think, you know, generally speaking, I agree. I think Kerala is a much more devolved and therefore much more local self-governance and therefore much more, you know, access to self-determination uh, model than uh, we are. We certainly will increase the devolution after the Sixth Finance Commission. But uh, some things, uh, I think, you know, I, 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 if I say something, it will sound like I'm biased because I'm sitting at the state level. But there are a lot of examples of devolution going really bad elections not being run, you know, jobs not being occupied, uh, violence, murders. So, you know, you have to first create some kind of harm. In fact, a lot of economists and a lot of IS officers would say that had we developed faster in Tamil Nadu, we wouldn't have gotten as good outcomes in uh, bringing the rural population up to somewhere near urban levels. It's only because the land, uh, the land departments drove consistency in uh, the, the school or the meal scheme or whatever. So I, I think uh, it's safe to say that the direction should be towards greater devolution. Uh, there, there's no reason we should have to go the other way. Uh, as we progress, as the per capita income goes up, as the scale goes up, as the complexity goes up, it all argues for more devolution. In fact, it argues for devolution in a different way, meaning if I allow 400 different points to make decisions and uh, take control. The odds of spectacular failure coming from one place, like a four-hour lockdown or a demonetization, go down a lot. Right? Uh, the, the, the problem with concentrating power in one hand, one bad mistake can just completely ruin an economy or a society. Involving, uh, you know, to the lo local bodies, but what if the state doesn't participate at all uh, and give it to more free enterprise because there's a there's a, a nuance or a, or a balance between the two. So, what's your opinion on what that level of balance should be? I know it's a hard question, but I'm just trying to figure out what uh, heuristics you would apply uh, to making decisions there. The Justice okay. Party. There are clear rules for the state, 
we call a quasi state which we consider the cooperative sector uh, which is not profit seeking participatory but not other than the kind of gentle support or oversight of the government is really a people run enterprise and then there's private enterprise so you know provision of uh, public goods and services should be done by the state you know uh, running of um, infrastructure for the most part should be done by state now done by the state doesn't mean that I'm against PPP doesn't mean that I don't want private investment order I'm saying the control of pricing and the delivery of quality is the responsibility of the state for public goods and services whether it's drinking water or garbage removal or uh, sewage, uh, you know, pipe development or whatever. Then there's things like insurance, housing societies, crop uh, loans and all, which is better run by cooperative, uh, not-for-profit mutual societies. And then, you know, clearly innovation, uh, large manufacturing, large service organizations, uh, startups, uh, tech hubs, you know, uh, all they should be done by private. The state has no business. In fact, uh, I'm also the Minister for Human Resources and Management of the state. The state is a very inefficient operator altogether. The cost of labor is very, very high, two, three times the market. Uh, the alignment of incentives or accountability is very low. So there are many things the state simply should not get into. But I think there's new models of hybrid kind of PPP and uh, you know other versions of, uh, many versions of PPP. Uh, that can actually alleviate a lot of the problems. I agree, the state should not go where it doesn't have to. Uh, financial devolution is on one side, but financial discipline on the other side, and how do you put the checks and balances in the system? Because we've had now a case of Sri Lanka. We being a larger nation, it may not have happened yet, but if it happens, it could have a very far-reaching conclusion. So Sir, I would like to see any state where the provision of freebies broke the exchequer or broke the balance, right? Uh, well, what they call freebies. I have, um, I don't have it with me this evening, but I showed it this morning at the other debate. Every year we get two letters from the union government. We have our FRBM Act equivalent, they have this. When they need to, they amend. I think the last year's uh, fiscal deficit of the union government was close to 7%. percent The FBM says 3 The finance commission says make it 35 or 4 or 4 and a half or based on COVID and all that. Still, 7 is a long way away. They amended their act. Nobody else can ask them a question. We all amended our acts. It doesn't matter what my act says, 4, 5, 6, 10, 12. It's within my right constitutionally to amend my own act. Their act only applies to them. My act applies to me. But then they send me these letters and yeah, they say that because of section 293.3 of the constitution, uh, article of the constitution where you cannot borrow without my consent as long as you owe me money, I'm here by telling you that you can only borrow down to the last crore this many rupees and only so much of that from the market at this time or other, they constrain us in 100 days. Now I'm saying if they already constrain the total borrowing and the uh, kind of fisc, on what basis should somebody tell me whether I choose to spend that money on giving rice or giving uh, you know, laptops? Or that's what the people elect us for. So I, I'll break all three separately. I'll say I don't know yet any government that went into deficit and uh, failed because of so called freebies. There is a whole world debate to be had about which investment is more creative, which is, has a higher multiplier effect which is inflationary, which is only for risk management or mitigation, which should be applied only in extraordinary circumstances like COVID. That's a nuanced debate that thoughtful people should have, not by diktat. And then there's a separate question of why should the union be in the business of telling states what they should and should not do? They've already told us how much we can borrow. They've already told us how we have to keep the macro under control. Then we have, uh, you know, non-discretionary expenses. We have to do payroll, we have to do pensions, we have to do a bunch of things. After that, how we choose to spend our money, that's what the people elect us for. Why should some extra constitutional dictate come telling us what we can or cannot? That's the principle. Is there, is there other good and bad ways of spending government money? Absolutely. That's a whole separate debate. Why is somebody else telling us what we should do? The people elect us, we do. They don't like to throw us out and get somebody else, right? 
that's a separate debate altogether and i reiterate i am yet to see any government that has gone in violation of its borrowing limit or uh, you know become bankrupt or defunct you know the government inside the country of india based on giving something for free then the, the first case was man mismanaged under boys but i don't know an example you have to give me an example before i reconsider my view at least the august presence of uh, dr ravi deru former finance commission chairman and uh, in during his term as chairman he had uh, allocated much more to the states uh, i must uh, you know you must all appreciate that however i i i keep reading that uh, some of the states are in huge debt uh, of course it's not uh, it's a kind of supplementary to that question how is it that punjab tamil nadu and bihar and bengal have such huge debt and whether whether they can how they are going to manage uh, you as finance minister can enlighten us second question is telugu is a mother tongue of a large population in tamil nadu unfortunately the language telugu has been dropped from the school curriculum i understand and uh, now the the the, the those who uh, speak telugu they have gone to uh, the appeal to the supreme court now the case is in supreme court to include the telugu language again in the school syllabus now you talked about two language theory that only english and tamil but uh, i think you kill the telugu language in tamil nadu school i'm not sure that you offer tamil in andhra pradesh or in karnataka so uh, you know uh, there's no guarantee that i should do for you what you don't do for me so i have no any sympathy for it i'll find out what the law is but i completely completely was informed when we talk about the debt so i don't, I don't understand how to look at debt or i don't know how to read the stats we have to look at debt as a percentage of gdp not as random numbers the scale of the economy is much much bigger than the scale of punjab or west bengal so the conventional measure of looking at debt is called debt to gdp in debt to gdp the first stage you mentioned there is a gap of 10% at least in the debt to gdp number so you should be better informed i don't know the situation is in tamil nadu in tamil nadu at the onset of the fbm act the debt to gdp ratio was about 26 or 27% over the long years of continuous improvement across dmk dmk and admk the ratio came down to 16% debt to gdp one of the best in the country after the illness of ms jalata incarceration first then illness then death the successors took that ratio back from 17% to or 16 16% to 26 27% we have come and we have kept it there and i'm committed in the next few years that i'll bring it back under 20 before anybody comments about my debt to gdp ratio let me tell you that the Indian government's debt to GDP ratio is more than 60% by some measures if you take all the uh, price use is 90% as I asked before I'm asking you is it that the children of Tamil Nadu pay back the government of Tamil Nadu's debt and people from Mars pay back the Indian government's debt no one will have a share in that ask some reasonable questions right that's a hypothetical question but I hope you'll answer it if you were to be made the finance minister of india which i hope you will um what are the first immediate steps that you would take to bring the economy back on are it harder than anything i've ever done uh by god's grace we are delivering results that are unprecedented there's still probably four or five years worth that have committed that in two years will become a revenue neutral state which is after 7 years of record deficits in 3 years we'll come back to revenue neutral which means that by 2425 we'll quadruple our capital investments from 37000 crores to about 130000 crores if i can pull that off that's uh, the biggest achievement i'll ever do in my life i don't have any ambition beyond that 
I can barely do the job I have now. I have no vision about other people's jobs. Yeah. Doctor, patient ratio. You also spoke about how uh, the medical colleges, the hospitals, the primary, the second primary are so interconnected. Would you like to throw some light on that first? Secondly, you also said that the union government should actually come and learn about the medical system in Tamil Nadu. So how well have you been able, I mean, when I say you, it's the government, to sell your idea of the medical system to various other states in India or through your MPs in the parliament? And, um, you know, uh, how, how, how would you describe it? If you can just throw some light on it. I have never said that anybody should come and learn from us. I have never said a big grudge putting in one rupee in taxes and getting back 35. I have never said that uh, my right to self-determination should be absolute. All of it starts from the other end. Because you try to thrust something down my throat, because you tell me that you know better than me, because you say I should follow your standard, then I ask the question, why should I? On what basis? Right? What health system exactly does the union government run? Other than a few aims, what does the union government run? How many million people does the union government directly provide health services to? Why should they come and tell us how to do our job? We have 80 million citizens. We know what we're doing. We have very good outcomes. So the point I was making is, if you intrude into something like saying, you shall follow this entrance test only and not give priority to people who are willing to serve in rural areas, or not give priority to poor children who have only been able to go to government school. All the things we used to give. I ask, either it should be based on you having a better outcome, but you can't have because you don't done anything other than a few institutions of high excellence. Or you should say that we have done badly, but we have done better than everybody else. Or you should say it's a standalone thing that doesn't affect everything else, but it affects everything else. Or you should say, it's my money, therefore I tell you how to spend. It's not. We spend the money entirely. 20,000 crores a year we spend on our money from the state's revenues. So my only question, in, in all of this, right, I, I am not a combatant. I am not here to fight with anybody. I got a day job to do. That's a hard job. It's only when somebody starts trying to interfere with our ability to execute or tries to tell us we should change a model that is working for us. I mean, there are a hundred things we can improve in our health department. I'm the first guy as finance minister to say, I must have a better patient information system. I must have a better hospital administration system. You know, the number of debates I get into and say, unless you do this, 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 we will not provide additional funding. There are many things we can do. Do we get good outcomes? Absolutely. Are we spending the right amount of money for it? No, we're spending way too much money. Or rather, for this money, we should be getting much better outcomes than this. So all that is true. I'm not saying that we're perfect. I'm not saying that we won't listen. After we came to government, in every field, we have appointed advisory committees or uh, panels or commissions. In our own department, we have one for economic advisors. We have one for reform of audit. We have one for... Uh, litigation risk on behalf of the government. We have one for federal fiscal relations. We have one for um, human resources now. We, we take eminent people from around the world and we take their advice because we know we can always benefit from it. It's the diktat that bothers me. Diktat coming from people who neither have the constitutional basis to do it, nor a track record of delivering better, and simply telling us, you shall do because I say so. This seems like perverse logic to me. That's the only thing I'm pushing back against. I'm not looking for any confrontation with anybody. That's not my job, right? I have delivery, I have results to deliver. That's what I feel. Because of technology. It is possible that because of technology, uh, banking transactions, for instance, they are now using CBS, and branch which were distributed thing are now being centralized in one place. And at, a, at the stroke of a single button, we have a million monkey bots and a crores of uh, fake messages going on. Don't you think that in the context of the uh, of technology, devolution of powers will be more difficult and uh, transaction costs will be cheaper when, uh, as technology progresses? A couple of countries and I ran banking operations in tons of countries as a managing director. I would say there are some things that we do in India far better than 
any country I've seen in terms of the payment system, in terms of the you know um, maximum time between uh, drawing from my account and depositing another account, uh, in terms of the connectivity of UPI and all that, we are we are very far ahead. I don't see that as de facto driving to centralization. For example, in the government terminal, uh, we can easily separate uh, visibility of data from authorization to activate. Right? You can still say only the village can make the payment, but I can see what's happening in, in uh, the office. Because I would say two things. One, there are lots of places where we collect data and do nothing with it. Uh, in the GST council, I keep asking. There is no greater treasure trove of data than the GSTN's data, right? How often do you find one institution that has 100% of all transactions can be analyzed for time series? If we implement some policy change, we can look at the three months before and the three months after and find out what did it really mean. I have never yet been to a GST council where there is any conversation based on data. Uh, everybody has one philosophy, another philosophy, another perception, another imagination. Nowhere is our debate informed by this is the hard data. A simple example. We said we want to go to 0% GST on medical, um, you know, COVID-related medical supplies and devices. Some states said no, 5%. I asked the question, how much is the total volume of such devices? Is it 5,000 crores? Is it 500 crores? Is it 50,000 crores? Then we'll know what the loss of 5% is. There is no data. So there's a lot of places where we collect data. And I'll give you another example, Corwin. Corwin data is uploaded into a union government database, every single vaccine of every single person. Of course, there's errors. I get in my phone claiming I've had a vaccine and I haven't. Done. That's a different issue. But every single vaccine is captured. One of our economic advisors told us ahead of the third wave, one way to find out your hotspots of risk is to do kind of overlay of three different surveys. Survey number one, what percentage of people have been vaccinated? Survey number two, what percentage are either very old or uh, chronic illness or whatever? And survey number three, um, there some, uh, how, what percentage of antibodies? Let's do antibody tests and how many have antibodies? The first two we could do. The third one, we want to get the data. There was no access to the data. The union, not only were we not using it, the union government was not using it for anything. Other than to say, rough percentage is this. They were not actually using it. So we wanted to know street by street, block by block, what percentage of people have been vaccinated. So, you know, just because you can collect data doesn't mean that people are actually using the data. And just because you have the power of zero marginal cost data doesn't mean that you have to centralize. The, the, you know, uh, the data can be in one place and still the authorization to activate or deactivate or do whatever can be still vested in the local. Uh, for example, one of the things we're going to do is send these funds, and this is why I've been saying for a long time that we don't apply for a payments bank license because we, we do DBTs and all that. But were I to have a payment bank license and have a wallet for these people in my bank, then I could analyze all kinds of things about when they draw it, what is it likely to mean about their spending patterns, what is it likely to mean about their uh, you know, economic situation, uh, if I change something, how does that reflect? Because then it will be more data. You know, if I try to get it from some other vendor, sometimes I give it, sometimes I don't. So I'm not sure that I think on the whole, better technology, better systems are positive without that much downside, unless they are intentionally either negligent and nobody uses it, or designed with no intent. Right? A lot of the human government's data collection is designed with a different intent. Then we have some concerns about it. It is to actually participate well in a well-devolved system. For instance, here we have Manthan. How many districts, how many villages have a Manthan going on? And how is it that in every village, in every town in Europe, they have built squares where people can come and meet spontaneously to discuss issues of interest? And none of our villages or our towns or cities have this convenience, where people can come and talk to each other about issues that concern them. And we ha why is it that our states do not build infrastructure for people to meet, you know, citizens, basically, to meet each other. 
that is fundamental, I think, to devolution. You can't have proper devolution if you don't have the skills or the infrastructure. The mandas, which is like uh, the tree under the tree or uh, in the central place, these exist in almost every village, every town, uh, every block, or every ward in every uh, um, city. So there are, if it's a question of places to meet. In Northern Constituency, for example, there are probably, I don't know, 16 wards now. I would say maybe 10 or more of these wards have either a community hall or, um, you know, some otherwise public gathering place that belongs to the corporation, which is not built up, but is just open, what they call Mandre. It's like an elevated uh, piece of, you know, land under a tree. Um, the first is a more complex question. That uh, we try our best in Tamil Nadu to run training programs. Uh, actually, I go one step back. I was just recently in Australia on a on a government uh, visit, and uh, I was somewhat gratified. Oh no, no, I won't say that. I was somewhat less dis disheartened to hear from a minister there what I have been saying about India is that the skills required to be big enough in your party to be given a party ticket the skills required to win election without paying money or using extraneous variables. The skills required to be a good legislator, to actually read the bills and have an informed view and, uh, you know, uh, be able to communicate with uh, tens of thousands of voters. And the skills required to be a minister, there's very little overlap between those in today's India, right? But at the end of the day, we're a democracy. So whoever gets elected, we can't get to predict or control who gets elected. What we can do is once they get elected, do a lot of training and do a lot of uh, upskilling for them. So at least in Tamil Nadu Assembly, we do that a lot, both for the general uh, MLAs. We run like a five-day induction program after they come. And when we started more recently, it was, uh, it was non-existent. Uh, we do for the, at least again, May. Uh, uh, department committees, the Public Accounts Committee, the Public Estimates, I mean the Estimates Committee, Public Undertakings Committee, we run special trainings for them from the CAG. We send them on tours. At one point, I used to think these tours were just boondoggles. But I've now come to the conclusion that many people come with such limited views that sending them around for the marginal cost of traveling within Tamil Nadu, it's a huge win that it opens their minds and it gets them to see how different things work. In the cooperation of Madurai, again, because I'm the minister for the urban area for my for my party, um, I I try my best to get as much training as possible, particularly for the mayor, the committee chairman, the accounts committee chairman, the audit committee. Um, you know, we don't get to pick the, the constitution lays down what are the minimum qualifications, so we don't get to pick who stands and who who wins. But we can do a lot uh, after the win. And in fact, we should probably have done much more than we're doing now. Uh, certainly, the Chief Minister is committed to it. Um, we'll probably see if we can make a more formal and more elaborate training mechanism. Um, I think it's needed more of the local bodies than the MLAs, but I think it's also needed for MLAs. Yeah. Yes. That um, over the past maybe 50 years we've noticed that those who are knowledgeable I'm not saying capable those who are knowledgeable do not get an opportunity to rule maybe rule is a harsh word but that is what it is in a democracy but those who rule over these past 50 years I've not seen whether they are really knowledgeable and one of the reasons I've come to listen to you is because I know you're both knowledgeable and you are there to rule now my question is, isn't it time now that we come to a stage where, I mean we have talked of reservations for so many other things, all in good interest but keeping the vote bank in mind. Is it not time that we devote some effort in trying to see that there is reservation for those who are knowledgeable, not, not for votes but for those who can determine and make decisions there sitting either at the assembly or at the local body or in the center. Because we have noticed at all three levels, irrespective of parties, that the knowledgeable in the party only attend monthans. The others 
sit in the assembly and decide as to how the booty must be shared. There is a very rarely a person like you, and I hope it's going to prove, uh, 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 what shall I say, you be a predecessor for a lot of this, that somebody who is knowledgeable, and I'm not saying again capable, that will only decide after your five years. If you are knowledgeable, we believe you are, and you have proved it on a number of occasions. If you are knowledgeable, isn't it time that we started having reservations for the knowledgeable in the assembly or in the local body? Otherwise, we'll be we will only be reading what the social media tells us about what people are. And we'll continue to have thousands of mantans over the years. I think there must be a quick solution to this. My generation on a scale of knowledgeable, right? Who would be the arbiter? How would we uh, come up with some universal consensus? I think I'll go a different way. I, I mean. Um, it's a testimony to my leader, I think, to some extent, uh, to circumstance that I get to sit where I sit, and not so much knowledgeable, but having executed and run large organizations and therefore being able to bring that skill set to uh, this job. But uh, the easiest way to do what you want would be to look at a presidential style system like in the US, right? Once the guy gets elected, he gets to only pick. Uh, technically qualified people and they run the administration. But again, I'm not sure where the trade-off is. Because even now in theory, in the Rajya Sabha, you can get people who don't have to go through election, you can get people who can easily come uh, you know, into the office without going through the rough and tumble of politics which may filter out a lot of people that you might otherwise consider knowledgeable. But then again, what is the notion of democracy, right? I mean, uh, I would say, at least in my case, uh, I don't think I could do the job I'm doing today with all the other education and the experience and all the other things I brought to the table if I had not been opposition MLA for five years. And if I had not gone campaigning street by street, door by door, hands folded, and uh, kind of develop the humility that that brings. I don't think I could do the job that I'm doing. So I'm not sure that knowledgeable is a you know basis. Uh, if anything, I would go the other way. I'd say the defining characteristic of a politician ought to be empathy, ought to be consideration. Not you know, knowledge comes and goes. We can get good advisors. We can get good police officers. Uh, you know, a genuine uh, feeling for the people, I think, is probably more important. My finance minister has come to Hyderabad, so <laughs> I welcome uh, you <laughs> to Hyderabad. So, uh, th this is more of a opinion than the question. Basically, uh, you were talking about uh, the urban bodies coming up with automation of uh, um, food. So, basically, what I believe is, uh, the more the touchless, the more the automation comes in, uh, the more cashist it becomes. Because uh, we see a lot of uh, uh, Dalit cooks not being allowed to cook in uh, a lot of schools, uh, including Tamil Nadu and most of the uh, states as well. And uh, they, there were issues like when uh, uh, the public-private partnership comes in. and uh, they dictate what kind of foods the children should have, like uh, the sattvic foods in schools. Uh, so I I firmly believe, uh, as a student of Dravidian movement, I feel, believe that Dravidian uh, movement and the Dravidian organization uh, should not encourage the automation. Rather, they should encourage more of uh, Dalit cooks and. Uh, if you say I'm only employing caste cooks, then I say it's uh, discriminatory. I'm saying I don't, I can't afford to spend 70 rupees of every hundred paying for labor. That's not what a restaurant's cost is. That's not what any other food preparation cost is. I'm just trying to deliver my intended scheme, which is nutrition to the children at the lowest cost and the least complexity and the highest quality possible. Uh, I'm not saying that that applies for everything. 
I'm saying in that particular instance, automation is hugely valuable to us. I'm not sure why it is discriminatory to anybody. Uh, I'm not sure I can go out of my way and say that instead of machines, I'm only going to employ Dalit cooks. I don't think that would fly either because the reservation is only a certain percentage. I can't say 100% has to be Dalit cooks. So maybe that part I don't get. If you say I was the system casters, yeah, a lot of people are system casters. We are still fighting. I'm, I'm saying uh, we are a long way away from saying we, we have achieved full social justice. person from Tamil Nadu asked this question to Mr. Jayashankar. The thing is, uh, in the minds of Tamil Nadu people, there is a Mardian kind of thing is there. Can you elaborate on this? Tamil word Mardian. Uh, this uh, crew question and answer session was held in Tam uh, Th Thailand and we, it was uploaded in YouTube also. Can you please elaborate on this? I just speaking to you. Sir, first of all, my question is twofold. First thing is, what's your opinion on GST? Uh, because it's been five years and I think we should have an impartial debate on this. The second thing is, why is the devolution being politicized? This is for the first time, right? Because we've been studying for civil services and all this. For the first time I have seen this, that the rhetoric of uh, devolution, financial devolution is an automated process. I mean, state takes the taxes and state goes back to the state. Uh, why is this uh, uh, devolution being politicized? Political rhetoric. And what's your opinion on this, right? We have seen the state doing this, we have seen the center doing this. Don't you think we should move forward from this? 2 percent to 42 percent. Two things happened. Right? Cessions and surcharges went from 6 percent of the total tax collection to 20 percent. I think the data tells the story. Neither has the union government ever used the cessions for the purpose it stated. Nor is the actual devolution close to 42%, it's closer to 30%, which is 32%. That was before. Most of all, if you take a state like Tamil Nadu, the percentage of money that comes to us from the union altogether is about 35% of what we pay then. But how that 35% comes in terms of share of taxes, which is effectively untied, or grants and schemes and increasingly converted grants and schemes, then that ratio is going very far against us. So it's not politics, it's basic math. We say, why are we getting our hands tied? Why don't you give the money the Finance Commission told you to give us? Why do you keep doing all these funny money accounting and trying to use politics and you know, trying to develop uh, kind of this, uh, you know, this uh, image of the uh, you know, benevolent emperor using our money? So, so there's no politics in it, it's just math. We're not getting our money the way we're supposed to get our money, so we're fighting for it. There's a, the, you know, I don't, it's not like equally valid arguments. Those of us who are not getting the money are fighting to get our money. As far as GST is concerned, you know, I've been very vocal about an uh, independent of regime, right? And in fact, I echo the current Prime Minister's words when he was Chief Minister about GST a lot, right? Whatever he had to say with GST, I say the same thing. But the thing that really worries me is not about the design, is not about the intent, is not about the constitutional amendment. There, there may be a hundred things wrong with it, or weak with it, or improve about it. What worries me now is that in its implementation and its execution every day, so many things can be fixed. I said it somewhere else, I'll say it again. If, as the CEO of JSTN or the CEO of a bank, I had the executive capability to do so, I would hire a hundred people, tax specialists, accountants, the legal experts, data analysts, system experts, and put them to work. There's at least one year's worth of hundred specialists of improvement that can be done to the GST system today. That worries me that we're not doing all of us do it as a part-time job. I'm a minister for four portfolios. Then I'm also on the GST Council, then I'm also on two GMs. Sometimes they meet, sometimes they don't meet, sometimes the convener exists, sometimes it doesn't exist. One GM I was on, the terms of reference said report shall come in six months. Within one month of that uh, uh, issuance of the terms of reference, the convener lost his job as Minister of Gujarat. 
therefore lost the seat on the GST Council, therefore was not convened anymore. Seven months went by before they issued a new order putting a different person as the convener. The terms of reference expired. Right? So I am saying the implementation is so, um, it could be so much better, so much more improved. That whatever the flaws in the system, they become secondary. It's the law of the land. I don't, I don't see any way of unwinding this simply. But we could improve what we have very, very much. Uh, if we apply the right kind of resources to it, that worries me a lot.